Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kurbis this evening to talk to you. Thank you. Having started the Beijing Axis eight years ago in, in Beijing, and we have three businesses, strategy sourcing and investment advisory. And we've done hundreds, even thousands of projects in these respective businesses. So I think that was um, uh, an informative uh, experience. And I hope that tonight will make a modest contribution to unraveling the myth and the hype. And maybe make China just another important market where you can do business and can succeed and can make money and ne not necessarily lose money or not necessarily see it as, as a threat. Five years ago, these dots that you see were investments of $40 million and larger by Chinese companies in the international sphere. Five years later, that's how it looks. The Made in China brand, you can go to any shelf, any part of the world, and there's a good chance that you'll find a China-made product on the shelf. Um, China is a, a, a much bigger uh, registrant of, of intellectual property. Um, um, and a, a recipient of uh, uh, royalties um, today than it was five years ago. So it's becoming more of an R&D and a science and a technology country. It is um, the world's biggest exporter. It's also the world's biggest exporter of high technology, believe it or not. China's rise, uh, you can see here a very busy chart, but essentially 2008, 1980. And you can see this red line is China. And what we have here is um, Japan. And what we are saying essentially is that China is just about to overtake Japan to become the world's second biggest economy. China has sort of gyrated between number seven and number 10. But over the stint from 1990 to last year, a very strong, consistent performance to become a significantly bigger economy than it previously was, and also than other sort of traditional G7 economies. And currently at almost a four and a half trillion dollar economy, with China at 4.9, it's just a question of does China grow at 9%, 7%, or 11%. The US at about just under 25% of the world economy. Japan, next, just a touch bigger than China. And China at about 7.3%. So Japan at about 8%, China at about 7.3%. And then it's very interesting. You go from Germany, France, UK, Italy, Russia, Spain, Brazil, to 65% of the world economy. And then you still have 180 countries in the world to make up that others. So that's, that's for me now the starting point. If we then look at the globe in terms of developing and developed, then it's very, very interesting. First of all, we've got the developed economy sitting there including obviously the United States, most of Western Europe and so on. Actually, all of, all of Western Europe. And Japan. And then we've got the developing economies at about 30%, roughly. Actually, if depending on different statistics, maybe perhaps just a touch below 30%. And China as the biggest developing country sitting there. We can probably expect that developing countries will make up a bigger share of the world economy in future. And China's share in that is probably going to increase more quickly than any other developing country. The first one is the geographic, geographical spread of China's GDP. <laughs> it's very interesting that if you take these provinces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, roughly ten uh, provinces out of the 33 administrative regions, uh, actually if we take out Hong Kong, 32, and, and Macau, 31, um, then you, you're really dealing with ten out of a very significant bunch of administrative regions contributing 60-65% of GDP. Now the most, one of the most important directives in Beijing at the moment is to, to spread that growth from those mostly eastern countries to central China, <coughs> western China, and northeastern China, and that seems to be underway. The next point is the structure of the economy in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary industry. And there we see very interesting dynamics. The primary industry is, in a way, having a revival because of China's focus on the need for resources. So far more exploration spending, mining spending, and other primary industries seeing a lot more investment and activity. At the same time, the factory floor, the secondary industry that you see here, the factory floor that China is known to be, is becoming more value added, more technology oriented, 
better diversified, more dispersed across the country, and therefore is almost having a second life. And at the same time, tertiary industry, which didn't exist 10, 15, 20 years ago, coming out of an era of more socialism and, and before that more hardcore communism, um, is, is very, very dynamic. To give you an idea, last week we saw the third quarter uh, GDP growth of 8.9% for China. Primary industry grew at 4%. This one grew at 8.8%. Uh, no, 9, 9 9.3, 9.5%, and this one about 7.5%. So it's very interesting that we're actually seeing tertiary outperforming the, the national average. So that means that we're seeing different engines, growth engines in China, and all of them sort of motoring at the same time in a relatively healthy fashion. That does not mean there are not risks. There are many risks, but on balance, these risks are being managed very, very well. 30% of China's growth, roughly maybe 32, 33% actually of GDP, derives from private consumption expenditure, so household spending, and that is low by international standards. Compared to South Africa is maybe one and a half times higher than that. Compared to the United States, um, the United States is more than twice higher in terms of PCE as a share of GDP. So medium and long term what we are saying is, is this share will increase as China becomes more affluent, as there's more urbanization, and as we see this sort of sustain, sustained story of success in the East become a central and Western success story, where there isn't a too significant fiscal uh, pressure situation or a foreign debt situation in China. So China is very, very different compared to what you know, countries like the United States and most of Western Europe lived through last year when they tried to spend their way out of trouble. There's simply much more room to maneuver in the case of China. And then finally, this net export contribution currently is very, very small because exports contracted in the most recent month by 15% and maybe in the first half of this year by around 20% as a result of a fall off in global trade. And it's also interesting to note that China overtook for the first time ever in the first half of this year to 30 June, Germany as the number, ex number one exporter in the world. Simply what it means is that China is outgrowing everyone. You can see historically and currently this year and next, this is uh, developing country growth, this is world growth, and this is of course developed country growth. So wh whoever you want to make uh, China compete against, it's, it's outperforming. China basically competes across a broad front and uh, is a significant threat but I would argue also, because of the market size and scope, significant opportunity. And South Africa is sort of caught in that process of realizing Asia is important, places like India, China, which they didn't realize, perhaps companies didn't realize 10, 15 years ago, but the capacity isn't there to attack the opportunity or to, or to defend in terms of uh, home turf. This is v fundamentally important as a starting point. Once you start to engage with entities, the due diligence that you should go to, in getting to know your potential partner. And then as strategy is sort of becomes richer in texture, you know, you have to go all nine yards. And then ultimately your strategy is only as good as the implementation. And having this as a sort of a, a framework to, to, to approach during, I think is, is, is a good idea. And I can honestly say from, from our own observation, uh, people just get so many aspects, implied aspects of this wrong. Next element of how to approach China is to be focused. Are you looking at a region in China, whether it's east versus west, whether it's maybe a you know, specific province, you know, what the topography looks like, um, is it uh, you know, different in climate? China is essentially a continent, and therefore you need to first keep that in mind. And then what industry or classification are you looking at? Maybe agriculture, industry manufacturing, services, is it consumer or corporate oriented or institutional, or are you dealing with the government? Is it low tech, high tech? Is it private, you know, versus um, maybe more semi-private? And then ultimately, where do you sit within the value chain in your industry?